On this episode of The Truth About Coon Hunting, presented by Houndsman XP, we have Mr. Jed Finley that uh, Josh tracked down. And the thing that I remember about Jed uh, when I first became aware of him, he was kind of the guy that brought a uh, business model to competition coon hunting with his trademark that's actually called Trader Inc. You're going to hear that whole story, and Josh is going to bring that out for you. This is a great place to get this segment of the Houndsman XP podcast started with Jed Finley and Trader Inc. Before we get there, we have got some mail, and it is in direct relation to this segment of the podcast. But I got a, I got a message from somebody that, that um, wanted to talk about last week's comment that I made about the crossover for big game hunters and how some of these competition hounds are still relevant today in big game hunting. And uh, this person said that the hounds that are winning today are not desirable for big game hunters. And this guy had several good points that he made. And he talked about uh, the the style of hunting, the nose, the way they open on track, different things like that. And I agree with all of that. But I do not agree with the fact that what's being hunted in the east in competition coon hunts can also be beneficial in the west for big game hunters. Or vice versa, what's being hunted in the west for big game can't be beneficial back here in the east for competition coon hunters. We're not that far away from the genetic bases that make both styles of hounds very, very good at what they do. And currently there are several competition dogs uh, that are competitive and have done a lot of winning that are contributing to people's big game packs. And anybody that's looking for more tracking ability and nose and things like that in a competition hound should be looking to the West. So it, it wasn't a one-sided challenge. Uh, I think both groups can benefit from each other. But the main thing is, this is the, the main thing that, the main point that I want to drive home. It doesn't matter if somebody is using their hound to do competition hunting in the East, or if somebody's using their hounds to chase lions, bobcats, or bears out West. Man, we are a small tribe. And we have to look for ways to work together and support one another and stop assassinating each other on social media and just driving wedges between these communities. We can't afford that. We're too small of a a group. And the cool thing about producing the podcast is the fact that we get to talk to people from all walks of life, everything that they do. I mean, we've we've interviewed people that are using terriers for rats in Boston, Massachusetts, and that's cool. We want to cover it all. So, I just I'm just saying, man, we got a we got a uphill battle here, as we talked about in our podcast on Monday uh, with the with John Bolin and the animal rights movement. We got to find ways to bridge these gaps, folks. And um, I'm telling you, there's hounds that are being turned loose in the West, and I've seen them. I've seen them go. I know where their roots are. They came from competition dogs right here. And there are several things that they could add to it. my coon dogs in the East, and I think there are several things that my coon hounds in the East could add to big game hounds in the West. And we've actually got that going on right now. I'll keep you updated on it. But, guys, that's, that's just our mailbag this week. And I, I really appreciate I'm not going to mention the name. I'm not trying to pick a fight with anybody. I'm just trying to answer some mail and give you some perspective. And feel free. I mean, reach out. Message me. Email me. Seth, Shorty, any of us. I mean, let us have it. We want to hear what you got. So thanks for that correspondence. Appreciate it. All right, guys, let's get down to it. We got Mr. Jed Finley ready to rock and roll and i know josh has been talking about getting an old south dog box so we're going to get him set up with an old south dog box but right now it's time to dump the box i see why so yeah 
You got me? Oh, yeah. I, I got you loud and clear. Oh, cool. This new fancy setup. This is like... What's legit? Yeah, it's way, it's, legit. it's way more than what we're used to. That is true. All right, folks. Uh, Josh Michaelis here with the truth section of the Houndsman XP podcast. And I'm joined uh, today by my good friend and dog partner and sometime uh, handler of, well, I guess you'd say you're my boss. I don't know about that. (laughs) We can go with that, though. Yeah. uh, You've paid the last three entries? Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, technically you're my boss, but uh, if those that don't know, that's the voice of Jed Finley of Trader Inc. Uh, Let's see, Jed, you are a national champion. You won nationals with Trader in what year? That was 2015. You're a PKC World Hunt finalist with Squeaky in... 2011. And you were a CHKC World finalist back when that was still a thing with Trader. 2014. 2014. So you've been in the finals of two World Hunts. Uh, You got close with Trader in the CHKC World. We got third. Yeah, but you were... Real close. That was one tree. One tree Make or break. Yes. 20,000? 40,000. 40,000. 40,000. That was a, and that bumped you down to third, which it paid. 5,000. So that was a $35,000 tree. Yes. Okay. That's what I thought. Well, I didn't, I thought, I actually thought it was 30 and five, but anyway. And then we won Super Stakes with Bones in 2008. Super Stakes champion. And uh, before we get started, I want to tell a little story about when I first met you. And that was. Duds was uh, 19 months old, 20 months old. So that yep. had been in 2013. Yep. Early 2013. And Bella was a year old. Yep. And my brother called me and he said, Hey, you got to come look at this dog. And you got to meet this guy. And I thought, Well, whatever. You know, he said, We're breeding, him to, we're breeding this stud dog to Suds, which is Duds' mom. And uh, he's got him up here. You got to see this thing. And so I drive up there and there's Jed. And there's Trader, who weighed, what, 90 pounds? It's a huge dog. All white, blue eyes, and to be honest, he was creepy looking. That dog was freaking creepy looking. But uh, <laughs> we got to talking, and my first impression wasn't the greatest because uh, we turned Duds and Bella loose, and Duds jammed a coon, and then you informed me that you were going to buy this dog. Yep. And I thought, who on earth is this guy? That's the only dog I got at the time. I said, yeah, I ain't for sale. Jed says, oh, I'll buy that dog. And so uh, I was kind of mad. I thought, you know, this is the guy I think he is. Come here and buy my dog. I ain't poor. I ain't rich, but I ain't poor. I don't need the money. I need this dog. And before it was all over, you owned half the dog. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> and we've been, we've been pretty good buddies ever since. I'd call him my best friend, actually. And he's also my guinea pig for all my new uh, social media ventures and my... Uh, podcast adventures and youtube and all that stuff too and he's a pretty good resource so uh jed thanks for being on here absolutely uh thanks for having me yeah we're over here at trader inc world headquarters which is slang for jed's house and uh, we're at the bar jed has a lovely place here and uh his bar is decked out with all kinds of taxidermy and mounts and it's a beautiful place if you look at the big show youtube channel you'll see it on there but uh we just wanted to talk to jed on this version of the truth uh with the Houndsman XP, Jed's a, a well-known handler. Do you know what your lifetime earnings are in PKC? 150-some thousand. Okay, so you won 150,000 PKC, quite a bit in CHKC, quite a bit in CHK, or in non-sanctioned hunts. So you've been around a while. Yep. And uh, we've discussed some of the trader dogs on the on the YouTube channel and stuff like that. But let's give everybody just kind of... Uh, overview where first of all how'd you get your start like not 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 in the pkc world or these high money hunts but like first time you went coon hunting you remember it yeah i was uh just a young kid and uh my brother and his buddies just had some old grade dogs and they were going coon hunting one night and my brother's like you gonna go and i think i was six or seven years old went out and uh they treated a den tree and back then coon heights were worth something so they went up and got the coon out of the den they didn't shoot it out, nothing like that. They just brought them out alive most of the time. And when I seen that first dog and coon fight, I was hooked. 
And then I was wanting to go every time they went, I would go. And then my brother, when he went off to college, I got his old dogs. And they were all great dogs. I mean, they weren't, they were on no papers. And um, Howard Thompson, where he was getting his dogs from, had the papers, just wouldn't give it to him. <laughs> so... <laughs> And uh, so then I got to be friends with Howard, and then we got, I got into some registered dogs and started hunting UKC. And from there, it was, you know, pretty much history. I was so hooked at that age. But when I could start driving, I was, the weekends, I was coon hunting. And so you, I talked, I actually talked with Chris today uh, on the inaugural episode of this very podcast. And he, I said, you know, some guys are, because we were talking about competition hunting and how some people probably wouldn't coon hunt if it wasn't for competition hunting. If that, That's where they got their start, and that's their niche, and that's where they mm-hmm. like to be. And so that's what keeps them going, yep. you know. But I said there's also guys that, and I've taken kids like this, that uh, they just, the first time they see a dog and the first time they go and the first time they you know get the experience that's all they can think about yeah there's just them houndsmen that are just hooked from the very first minute i wasn't one of those guys because my first hunt was miserable and i look at it now my first maybe 15 or 20 hunts my first 200 hunts compared to today's standards is probably miserable (laughs) but uh you know so you were one of those guys that just decided you know once you've seen that and you experienced that is this what you wanted to do a lot yep and i mean i i still if there wasn't competition hunts, I'd still be pleasuring yeah. all the time. That was a question I was going to ask. This question I'm going to ask everybody on this because there's some guys that, and there's nothing wrong with that, that if it wasn't for for competition hunts, they probably wouldn't even hunt. But uh, so you started group with, like we all did, or 90% of us, old gray dogs. Wasn't your family, your dad never coon hunted, your grandpa, no, nothing like that? Gra- grandpa did, but not not my dad. Yeah. But and then my brother, Grandpa pretty much quit before I got in. Yeah. Into it. I still got his old light, his old wheat light. That's cool. Um, it is, uh, needs a little battery acid to get fired back <laughs> up, but I don't think we're going to do that. What, uh, what kind of dogs did you guys start with? You said they were great dogs. What breed were they? They were walkers. Was they? Yep. And then I got, I, once I got into it, I switched over to the black and tans just because everybody had walkers. And so I wanted something a little bit different. And um, when I switched over to black and tans, I really liked their mouths and everything. And then then they became hard to find. A, a good, good one. one. Yeah. So then, and I was in the competition aspect of it. It wasn't just about pleasure hunting anymore. I, had, I wanted to compete. So I went back to walker dogs. And um, that's just the way it is. I mean, I'd, I'd still hunt anything. I don't give a crap if it was pink, purple, or blue. I mean, I'm going to hunt if it's a winner, but I just can't find that right one that's we, uh, not a walker. I remember years ago, we were looking for a black and trained female to cross mm-hmm. on trader. Yep. You wanted to cross a black still and trained female Still looking. So you're not exactly a treeing walker, breeder, and fancier purist or anything like that. You know, it doesn't have to be. Absolutely not. If they tree coons, you just I'll wanna, own it. You just want to cash them checks. That's right. <laughs> So, uh, and Finley, quit drinking your drink right next to the microphone. All I can hear is your ice rattling. Hey. <laughs> if you're around me and Jed, and these guys have been around us at these hunts, so these guys, we argue a lot. We do argue. Yeah, a lot. we argue a lot. But uh, what about your first, I know the story of your first competition hunt you went to, but what about the first one, first cast you handled in? Do you remember it? The first cast I handled in was a UKC hunt, and I still remember the two people I had to hunt against and in Iowa at the time it was Jay Thomas and Johnny Ferrari and they were both Englishmen they're not from England but they were English hound hunters English. they had English hounds <laughs> they're <Yeah>. Englishmen <laughs> they're Englishmen I was picturing uh, uh, hello mate <laughs> <laughs> no no but they uh they were I mean they were big into the UKC um and me I didn't know nothing well that night, Kelly McCombs ended up going with me on the cast mm-hmm. because they didn't have enough, or they took a dog out or something. So he drove me in, to the woods and everything. And uh, How old were you? 14. <laughs> and I drove to Boone, Iowa to the hunt. 
<laughs> Your dad just let you take the truck, or did you just take the truck? I think we just slipped out somehow. I got gotcha. you. Yeah. I got gotcha. you. So I went to that hunt, and uh, I mean, granted, I got throttled. Didn't know what I was doing. Dog did fine job. Yeah. The handler did horrible. <laughs> but, I mean, I got a lot of lessons about the first 25 hunts I was in. Um, and a lot of it was... You know, I thought people were doing stuff to me and stuff like that. It was just I didn't know. Yeah. I mean, I was being retarded, basically. <laughs> um, I didn't understand the rules. I got scratched one hunt. One hunt. I was winning it, and I thought, "Oh man, I'm gonna, I'm in good shape. You know, I'm gonna win up my first hunt. Go to the tree, start squalling, get scratched. You know, what? How many casts were you in before you won one? I think thirty. I bet I was pretty close to that too. It was re- a lot. Well, it was a big deal when you won too, wasn't it? Oh, Did man. like your parents get all excited? And Well, not really my parents, yeah. but boy, I was sure excited. Oh, I yeah. even got a picture. Really? Yeah, it was it, it was, it was awesome. a big deal to me. I know when I was coming up and I was following my grandpa to these hunts, he never won. I think maybe he attended a hundred, over a hundred casts, and I think he won three of them. I still got all the trophies at the house, and... I think I was probably in 30 of them, too, before I ever won a cast. And I remember it. it, uh, Give a shout-out to Tim Seals. Remember Tim Seals? Oh, yeah. Tim Seals was in that cast, and he was part of the reason I won. I was hunting a dog called Missy, and she got got in there, got split, had a coon, and another cast member didn't want to see it, and Tim physically drug him around the tree and pointed his eyeballs at it and asked him if he's seen it now, and he did. Tim, Tim, kind of a rough dude anyway. Good dude. I liked him. But, uh, yeah, guy seen the coon, and I won the cast. I still remember it. So so you won your first cast at 14. What dog were you hunting? Back then I was hunting a dog called Chief. Walker dog? Walker dog. I don't even know if it was correctly papered. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I know is his name was Chief. Um <laughs> I was hunting him for a guy called Chad Mason. Yeah. That's so you started out as a hired gun. No. <laughs> you were probably paying all the entries and just happy to have a dog. That's you? <laughs> exactly right. Cause I didn't have because all I had was grade dogs. Mm-hmm. You know, I didn't have one that had papers on it. Did they so. have you're a little younger than me and I don't know what you were up in Cherokee at that time, Iowa. Yeah. Yeah. So you were way up in Northwest. Did they have grade hunts and grade no. casts? They no, didn't. they those all stopped. Yeah. And see I was right at the tail end. You know, when I was like 10, they were still having a few grade casts. And I remember when they first stopped having grade casts. And we had one dog that was a pretty good dog that we couldn't hunt anymore. And Grandpa was all mad because that was their best chance of winning a trophy. Yeah. <laughs> so you won your first cast. You're 14 years old. You got it with the Chief. And so you started kind of the same way a lot of these guys started, you know, just hide hunter, went to some hunts, got hooked. Uh, what was your first... Was your first big winner the the black and tan female? Yeah, yeah. What was her name? Hope? Hope. Yeah. Yep. She was the first one um, when I first started going to Texas. She was the first one I started taking down there, and she performed really good down there. And um, actually, your brother and I, that's where we come become really good friends, was actually, you know, in Texas. Yeah. And then after that, we he had old Skipper down there. Yeah. And so it was a long time ago. He had ago. Skipper down at the Lone Star? Or was it Deuce? No, it was Skipper. It was a Skipper? Yeah. That was a long time ago. It was a long time Let ago. Let it have been an O. Because it was, and then he had Snickers right after that. Yeah. That's how long ago it was. Snickers was before her time. That was a kind of a wild yeah. go yonder. She was a nice dog. I like Snickers. She's kind of crazy sometimes, yeah. but she was, a good, she was a good dog. And so you got Hope, the black tan female. You started winning with her, and then you got your hands on Whitey. I went from Hope to Whitey, yes. Yeah. And Whitey's what really started the whole Trader Inc. franchise. Absolutely. And I never got to hunt with Whitey. Trader was a four-year-old. I think he was out of Super Stakes and stuff whenever I first started hunting with him. And Whitey had passed. Yep. And so I never got to. What was Whitey like? (laughs) He was just get by yourself. Nothing flashy. Um, He just, he got struck a lot better than the rest of them did. Um, But he was nothing flashy. Just fall through the country. Tree of coons. Just an old-style coon dog. Um, a lot of people loved him. A lot of people hated him because he did make you walk. I don't hear hardly any bad about Whitey. Every time someone talks about Whitey, a lot of people liked him better than Trader. Yes. And I think, 
I may be going out on a limb here, but a lot of people liked Whitey better than Trader because they didn't like you. I would say you're 100% <laughs> correct. I would say that had 99.9%. Because when they describe Whitey and then I think of Trader, they remind me a lot of the same kind of dog. You know, they'd kind of, they'd get deep. But Trader would treat coons close to. Yeah. A lot of people that didn't get to pleasure hunt with Trader didn't realize what he treated. We were hunting one night with him and Dollar. And we tr he treated like seven, eight, nine singles or something like yeah. that and never got over four or 500 yards from us. Yeah. And all this time Dollar was running through the country and treed one coon. Yeah. And so Trader was, trade. not everybody got to see a lot of Trader. But another thing, when we talk about that, is you know as well as I do how different these dogs are behind the house as opposed to eight hours from the house. Oh, absolutely. And Trader, to me, was night and day. Yep. So what was Trader like? So Trader would, would treat Coons close, and he would do some goofy things when he wasn't in a cast sometimes. But what was he like whenever you turned him loose when the pressure was really on him? Usually 95% of the time when it come down to you got to win – Trader would do it, and I don't know wh how the dog come up with it, but when you line him up against four dogs or three other dogs in a four dog cast, and you are away from the house, a different style of dog come out, and he found ways to win. Um, he treat a lot of coons, and going to this hour and a half cast stuff really has hurt us because our dogs are more you or well they were trained to be two hour dogs, so trained tra trained or kind of just that style to that begin kind of, with they more might might be more that style yeah but the biggest thing with them is right at the end of two hours they were always getting treat it was yeah. like an internal clock that they got like hour 54 minutes yeah they seems like boom they're getting treat and you run in it with rain shock does it a lot ralph does it bones does it trader did it i don't know how many casts I won in the last five minutes, but it was a bunch. Yeah, and Bella was the same way, too. Same I always way. felt like if I could just be within one coon with 10 minutes, and Rain gives me that same feeling now that I'm handling her some for you and Chase. If I can just be within one coon, mm -hmm. all I got to be is within 100 with four or five minutes to go, and I feel like I can win that cast. Yes. I feel like you really got to blow me out, and you got to beat me by two coons or not let me get my hands on my dog to win. And I think Trader was kind of that style yep. and threw it in his pups, but. One thing, so you went on to great things with Trader. Trader won $40,000 or something like that. Yep. And you raised pups with Trader. And Whitey, uh, Trader was out of Whitey. And then you made, I want to talk about what I consider, and this is arguable because there's been a lot of great tree and walker litters out there, but arguably the best litter to ever be produced was Trader and High Times Lights Out Liz. Yes. Now, run through the numbers here, me, here with me. We've got Shock, who's a platinum champion and won. Over 50,000. And what's the other? Is there Bones. A, Bones is a platinum champion and won. He's over 30,000. Ralph is a gold champion. Gold champion, so he's over 10,000. I don't know. What yeah. Exactly. Scent is a gold champion and 401k is a silver champion so five of those litter and she's pretty close to a gold champion right yes 401k is yeah. yes so there was only six pups in the litter yes five of those two platinum champions two gold champions and a silver champion that's nearly gold yes and that is unheard of yes and that is we talk about breeding these dogs and you hear you know, they'll just breed to whatever pays them, and they'll they'll do this. And some guys do, and they've had success with that, too. I'm not knocking it. But you took a different route yep. with your breeding program, a trader. How many pups does trader have on the ground? I had you, I and and I told Jed before I come over here, I said, you need to get trader's numbers before we get here. So he don't know these off the top of his head. He's not that vain. <laughs> so <laughs> I He's got 46 pups. Yes, this is confirmed by Brandy at PKC. Yeah. She, he's got 46 pups on the ground. Hundred and eighty eight thousand seven sixty. Did you do the per pup? I can't do that in my yeah. head. Per pup it was over four thousand yeah. per pup. So um, it sounds like like forty two, forty four hundred or something like that per pup. Yeah. And that's an, an insane number. For for the listeners that aren't familiar with PKC pup earnings and stuff, that's crazy. That is probably 
as far as any dog that's had more than one litter, that's got to be about tops. It's got to be close. Yeah, I don't. I haven't looked at the numbers, but I think there was one dog that had like seven pups and had yeah. seventy thousand dollars won or something yep. like that. So it was tenth. But I think he was second when last time I looked, which was quite a while ago. And so with Trader, who Trader was hot. Trader had stud ads in the bloodline. He had it in the Cooner. You had people calling, blowing your phone up. I want to breed to Trader. And what was you telling most of these people? <laughs> well, at first I was all about it. And then the more people called, I just couldn't deal with it. Yeah. I mean, I'm not, for those that don't know me, I'm not a great public person. <laughs> you're I'm not, not. I'm not my, Jed's you're my PR man. Yeah, when Jed's it comes people down to skills it. are terrible. <laughs> um, I mean, when I'd get called and asked a question about him, you know, what's he look like? I'd be like, are you shitting me? <laughs> we'll, we'll beef that out. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, look in the book. You yeah. can see what he looks like. I mean, he's got a, I had a full page stud ad. I mean, I just had enough. Yeah. What's his hunting style? Yada, yada, yada. And then I decided I'm not doing this no more. And I could have bred, I don't know how many females. So I went and collected semen and got semen for, you know, the group of guys that we hunt with yep. and that was it. And I know you told a lot of people, no, you bred maybe what, two or three outside females, four? Yeah. You know, I think, I think we've bred four outside females. That's where Rain was an, um, Rain's mama wipe out Chunky. Yep. She's yep. an um, outside cross. That worked well. And then Hellbilly Lily, which Razor's mama is, yep. um, that was an outside cross that too. That worked pretty well too. The yep. Razor had a litter mate that was pretty good too, didn't he? Yeah, they, there was actually four out of that litter that were really good. Yeah. Two of them got killed at a real young age. Yeah, and see, that's the thing. You see 46 pups, but how many do you think are still living out of Trader right I, now? I think right now, I think there's only 20-something. Yeah, because like T2 got blasto and died. Yeah. Uh, we had a female out of female that got lost. One yeah. of the, the the sixth female out of the out of the uh, shock and Ralph and them's litter. She got out of the kennel one day, and we haven't seen her since. Yep. And you know, some of them quick fell out of a tree. Yep. Broke. Yeah. Yeah. She she, she she broke her back, and they had to, yep. they had to, they had to euthanize her, which was a bad deal. And that was a good coon dog too. Yes. And she was pretty young when that happened. Three, I think. Yep. And then there's a lot of them that went to people. You know, they paid a good amount of money for them, mm -hmm. but then they didn't hunt them. Yeah. And then we ended up with them back, you know, and gave them to a youth hunter. Yeah. You know, there's if you look at Demon. Yeah. I mean, Demon can tree coons. He's won some money in Dream. PKC. Dream's another one. Yeah. I mean, we got the we got some good ones that we got back. They just didn't have the start yeah. that the rest of them did. And the thing that I love about all of them, they still have that same natural talent, but they're more country coon dogs because they haven't been prepared for a competition. Yeah. Hunt. yeah. Let's talk about that. People. And I tell people all the time that a meat dog and a, and a competition dog are the, are the same thing. Mm -hmm. we, these dogs can fill a truck bed full of coons. Yes. And we proved that, what was it, last December. Yes. We took uh, My gold champion Ralph, yep. silver champion King, uh, nearly a silver champion Con, and Oddball, who actually is a country coon dog that could win anywhere. Mm -hmm. This is a good dog, and we treat 22 coons in one night by 2 a.m. Yes. So it ain't like these dogs are treating a bunch of slicks and they're they're and they're doing crazy. These dogs can fill a truck bed full of coons. Mm -hmm. But the difference between the guy that's treeing two or three hundred coons in a season and a guy that's traveling down the road is a big one. And it ain't because of talent. Mm -hmm. It's because of what? Being prepared to be hauled in a dog box. Ninety five percent of these dogs that go out on the road, they gotta love a dog box. If they don't love the dog box and they want to sleep in it all the time, you let them out of their kennel and you go put food in their kennel and they go to the dog box instead. That's, I mean, they got to love the dog box and love to be on the road. And they got to love uncomfortable situations. Yep. Because these dogs are under a lot of pressure. They're not uh, turned loose in the same place. They're turned loose a long way from the house, so it's different. But what when you're looking at a dog... Because some of these dogs you've you've trained as pups, and some of them I've trained as pups, and some of them other people have trained. But we've bought some of these dogs back as young dogs. Shock is a good example. 
uh, probably the most successful one we bought because you know you had him till he was what eight months old, uh, ten months old. Yeah. Then I sent him to out to Indiana and then bought him back when he was four or got him back here when he was fourteen or sixteen months old, something yeah. like that. And so it's not like you know the, the dog hadn't seen some stuff, but he was pretty green whenever you got him back. He didn't get, he got hunted in Indiana, but he never got put in any cast situations or anything like that. Yeah. When Wes brought him back, Wes Hamilton brought him back for us. And he was, when he got him out of that dog box, he was as wide as he was yeah, tall. I, I swear. Remember. He was thick. And I yeah. thought, Oh my goodness. But we went to hunting him. I mean, it took us a long time to get the weight off him, get him right. You know, and he, he made it home a couple nights because of you. Yeah, I did. I I probably saved that dog from being uh, shipped down the road. I remember one night uh, we were hunting. He had went in and treated a possum. Yep. And he had went in and treated another possum. Yep. And Jed had said, I'm done. I'm out. I'm not hunting this dog anymore. We're getting rid of him. I'm done with him. And I said, let's just take him one more drop. I said, he's fine. He's Two two days, three days after you got him, I said he just got hauled halfway across this country. I said let's turn him loose one more time, and he treated that litter of kitten coons. He was split. Yeah, he was split in the water. I still got that picture. Yeah, on a litter of kitten yep. coons right he was after that. He's all the way up to his chest in yep. the water. Yeah, standing on his back legs. And what sixty thousand dollars later? Yeah, yeah, here he is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right, so you've. Uh, I want to talk about the the Trader Inc. Youth Program, and I want to talk about some other stuff, but. Before we get into that, what you you're talking about dogs that haul and you're talking about what are you looking for? You're you're one of the few guys that hunt your own stock. You know, you started with Whitey, you went to Trader, you now you're Shock and King, which so you're four generations away from your original dog. And not very many guys that are hitting these hunts do that. And that's not a knock on anybody, but I think of you and Cable and uh, Jess Dickerson still hunting stuff that goes back to old Naylor. Mm-hmm. There ain't very many people that are at a $6,500 Pro Classic with the dogs that they bred. Yeah. But if you weren't a breeder and you were look, weren't looking to hunt your own stuff, you were just looking for a dog that would could win, and you went to try out, say, a, a, a young dog, a one-year-old, what are you looking for to haul down the road and win? Um, biggest thing is, anymore with these hour-and-a-half casts, it's they got to strike decent. Um, my biggest thing is getting off by themselves and recutting. But the biggest thing, the next thing I'm going to look at is I want to haul them around a little bit and then recut them again later on. So go out and hunt a couple hours and then turn around, give them an hour, two, three hour break, and then go hunt them again. And you're trying to simulate a late round. Correct. And for those that don't know, if you're a lion hunter out west or, or just a common pleasure hunter, late rounds are a big deal in PKC. Yes, they are. A huge. If you can't win a late round, you're not going to advance. You're not going to do a lot of things. And so you picture these dogs that are hunting two hours under a lot of stress. They're getting put in a dog box. They're cold. They're chilly. They're getting in a nice warm box. They're getting cramped up and stoved up. And you're driving back to a clubhouse and you're waiting for the rest of your late round cast to come in. You drive another hour away from the clubhouse and you do it all over again correct and so you're trying to you want to you want to simulate that so if you was going to go try a dog would you try that you know if you say someone's got a dog for fifteen twenty thousand dollars and you're looking to buy it when you go to try that dog is that something you'd want them to do absolutely because the the one thing about it if they can't do what they did early late or at least show me the same hustle um and they might not treat as many coons late because the coons may be moving different, but if they're still hustling around doing everything they're supposed to, cause it ain't always about treeing coons when you go try a dog out. A lot of people think, well, I went and treed five coons with this dog. It's a great one. Well, just cause you went and treed five coons, you got to replicate that night after night. And the coons always move differently. They move different early sometimes, move different late sometimes. So basically, I'm looking for how they're moving around, what they're doing, how they're using their mouth, where they're moving around to, stuff like that. So it's not just about numbers. No. And I've said a hundred times, too, it's about hustle. Hustle. Because hustle is going to beat talent. Yep. Yeah. So let's talk about, we're going to switch gears a little bit here and talk about the Trader Inc. Youth Program. Uh what year 
are we in now five six five i believe five yep. and it was down it was held down south this year yes forstel yes missouri uh Freiburger and them guys helped yep. with that that is one uh one of the things that Jed's most admirable quality, probably, <laughs> is he puts on this huge youth hunt every year. So tell us about the uh, Trade Rink Youth Challenge. I, it was just a vision that I dreamed up and decided that we were going to do um, a whole youth hunt and pay $1,000 for first on an added purse side of things, um, $750 for second, $500 for third, and then $250 for fourth. Plus, then they get their PKC earnings on top of that. So... I thought about it, and then we started adding dream hunts to it and everything like that. So we're taking kids not just coon hunting. We're getting them into other styles of hunting, too. We take them whitetail hunting. We've taken them turkey hunting. We've taken them bear hunting, elk hunting. Hogs. Hog hunting. Yeah. You know, we, we get the kids in the outdoors, and it's basically a day for the family to get together, come out, enjoy the day. We do a fishing tournament, bench show, um, field trial everything that you can tree, think of. I think we had tree, tree and contests. contests yeah. um, tons of prizes and, and just make it a family event. What's the entry fee for that? It is free. I take care of all the entries for the kids. So it's free. The whole day is free. There's no charge for food, nothing. Water. I, that's one of my favorite hunts of the year. Uh, we have a great time at that. And I think I didn't get, I wasn't able to make it down to Forestdale this year, but... Uh, the last one we had at Mercer, would we have 80 entries? 80 entries. That's pretty good yeah. for a youth hunt in the middle of a pandemic. Yes. <laughs> and so we're going to talk to Freiberger and Burns and them guys, and we're going to talk to Freiberger, who's the new youth director, in a later podcast. So I don't want to delve too deep into the PKC youth program. I'm hoping he's going to cover some of that. But where uh, do we have any plans for the youth hunt next year? Youth hunt next year, um, we're going to probably keep it in conjunction with the Missouri State Youth Championship. Um, it seemed to help the draw for the youth championship. So anything we can do to draw more numbers, mm -hmm. that's what we're going to do. And what, say a, a, a kid has a dog, uh, he has a dad willing to haul him. Uh, what does he have to do as far as membership wise and stuff like that to be in that? Uh, the kid for a membership deal is ten dollars, and for, and that's two PKC. Yes, yeah. two PKC for the youth, and then fifteen dollars to register the dog if the dog ain't registered. So twenty five dollars. So you can show up with your dog, and twenty five dollars, and hunt and for hunt for thousand dollars. Yes, and you have drawings for the youth for the dream hunts. Yep. And, I mean, you got a chance to go all the way up to, what, Colorado to hunt yep. elk? We'd go to Colorado, hunt elk. We went to Wisconsin bear hunting, um, Texas hog hunting, Missouri whitetail hunting. So it's a good way not only to get the kids, like you said earlier, not the way to get the kids in the outdoors as far as following a hound, but yep. to just get them in the outdoors, period. Yes. All right, so shifting gears here, what I want to do... Uh, this show is called The Truth, this this version of Houndsman XP, which will air on Thursdays. Uh, so we want to dispel some myths about coon hunting and most specifically competition coon hunting. So I'm going to read you a quote from the internet, from, from the Facebook, <laughs> about... A Something that I uh, do not have. Yeah, No, Jed does not have any social media, which is probably wise, considering Jed lacks a filter. But uh, I'm going to read this from the Facebook. Let me see if I can get it pulled up here. And it's going to be a quote about competition coon dogs and their style or whatever. Something about competition coon hunting. And I got it right here, and it says that competition... Coon hunting is the reason, let me see if I can read this guy, I don't spell very good, is the reason that we ain't got no nose in these dogs today. All they do is tree slicks and score points with slicks. So what, what, what is Jed Finley, national champion, uh, top 100 PKC earner, say to that? Come on, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. 
<laughs> so how are these dogs winning all this money, Jed? Well, let's just put it this way. In 2018, when I won the Super Stakes with Bones, it took three coons. I had five and a quarter to win that hunt. Trader in the national championship treed two coons. All the other dogs treed one. A piece. Mm -hmm. The PKC world hunt was squeak. I'm just going through the big ones I've yeah. been in. There has been multiple, multiple coons treat. What to the, win these? What's the most coons you ever treat in a cast? <clears throat> I think eleven. Yeah, I think that was my tops too. Where was it at? <laughs> that was over at Mercer, Missouri. Where at? That was with um, Jason Gibson. Jeremy Reinhardt and Mike Ralston. Ralston was hunting Ralph. I was hunting Trader. Um, we had Trader, Shorty, and Tango, I believe. Yeah. And we treated 11, 11 coons in that case. You talk about uh, in Trader's National Championship win, when he treated two, the other dogs all treated one. Mm -hmm. Independence. Oh, absolutely. Well, so they talk about five and a quarter, and they say, oh, the dog treated uh three coons in two hours that's not that big a deal well that's not that big a deal if you're turning loose one, one dog. dog or you're turning loose a dog's the pack right so you're eating up these two hours walking oh absolutely and the bat the sad part about the whole super stakes was bones actually treed four coons ruger treed three coons and con treed three coons yeah. but one of those or one of those coons a piece was on timeout when a landowner come in and made us call timeout because we were on private property. Right. And they all treat another coon there. So in that cast, we scored, we would have scored 10 coons. Yeah. And this is... This is super stakes. And these are dogs that have been hunted all week long. All week long, early and late rounds. Yeah. And this is on Saturday. This is on Saturday. Tell me about, and I mentioned to you earlier, I wanted you to tell one good story about one memorable cast. And you were thinking of that Super Stakes Championship. Yes. So how did that cast go from start to finish? Give me the whole layout. Well, right out of the pickup, of course, I'm hunting a lower-end strike dog. I mean, just the way it is. Oh, well, hold on a second. Hold on a second. Before we delve into your cast, <laughs> we're going to delve into strike points. Yes. Now, I'm notorious for not liking a dog that barks a lot. You're notorious for not liking a dog that barks a lot. So we are usually struck... For a quarter. Yes. 50 if we're lucky. That's a good strike. Yes, if we get 50. I got 50 with rain the other night. Hey, I was so excited. If we get a 75 or 100, we'd write it down. Yes, and we usually it usually ends up not mattering in the end anyway. Yeah. So these guys that say that these dogs babble and they can't compete and they can't do this, you want a lot of money with dogs that don't get struck very good. Absolutely. What was the only good? Squeak was probably the only good strike dog you had? Um, yeah, Squeak and Whitey. I mean, both of them were good Good strike dogs, but I mean, so you can still go win a lot of money. I know I hit a hot streak with rain, winning twelve thousand dollars in a month. Yeah, and I never got struck for more than twenty five, except once, and it was for fifty. And she treed a circle tree out of the pickup and ate my fifty up anyway. Yeah, and so anyway, I just wanted to touch on strike points. What do you think about? You hear. Uh, Babbling dogs are cheating. It's just it's just condone cheating. It's all this stuff. What do you think about dogs that that are cut loose barking and stay barking? They still got a tree coon. Yeah. Plain and simple. I hate it. I can't stand hunting with it. But they still got a tree coons to beat you. Yeah. There's no reason your dog cannot go out there and say they got a babbler that just likes to run and gets treated once in two hours. You should be treeing two. Yeah. All you got to do is treat one more coon, unless you're in an absolute shootout. Mm -hmm. And I've seen that. I've seen that happen one time. I was judging uh, the Pro Classic with Ruby Shifter, not, and I can't remember who the fourth dog was. But we treated nine coons in that cast, and everything treated three. Bones. No, it wasn't Bones. That was the one with Big Country. Oh, Big Country. Yeah. Uh, it was, uh, it wasn't Qualm. It was somebody. It don't matter. But anyway, it, it was a shootout, and it came down to that. First cut out of the pickup, Ruby had 100, Shifter had 75, and that was the cast. But if not, gets treated in at a different time, If I and I'm judging, and Brent's telling me he can hear him and I can't hear him, uh, and Brent, God bless him, one of the greatest 
greatest guys in a cast in the, on the planet. Straight and I'm up telling honesty. him I can't hear this dog. And he don't get mad. He don't say nothing. He says, well, if you can't hear him, you can't hear him. And, and Ruby gets treed in and allowed her to treat another coon. <laughs> and that was the difference in the cast. Not actually treat four. But everybody got got put on the paper for three, and we had a big shootout. And that, that strike out of the pickup was actually the difference maker. But that don't happen very often. No, it don't. You, know, you, sh- you should be able to treat one more coon than that dog was struck for 100, no matter where you go. Absolutely. Okay. If your dog's operating. Yes. And it has hustle. Operating. And so I just wanted to clear that up, I yep. guess. <laughs> so anyway, tell me about uh, the Super Stakes cast. Well, when we cut loose, I mean, of course, I'm sitting there struck for 50, and it was a three-dog cast, and Ruger and Khan, bones all get treed, all split, all got coons. Cut loose again, we're split, we got coons again. You know, um, then we get ran out of the place. Drive around for an hour. Here comes my point about staying with a dog mm-hmm. that can move around and stay for an out, you know, be put in the dog box when they're on a hot streak and everything else, but put them up in the dog box. We drove around for an hour. I bet we covered, I'd say, 60, 70 miles driving around trying to find a hunting spot because everywhere we went, there was people there hunting Yeah, because um, they had the pup. The they puppy the, stakes. Yeah, they had the freshman super stakes yep. and then the three other cats for yep. the senior or for the juniors and sophomores. Yeah. So we drove around forever and finally got to a next spot and we cut loose and bones actually struck for 75. Wow. And how it happened, I have no <laughs> idea. But he went clear across the field and the other two went one way and Con made a bobble there. And Stokes withdrew him and Logan Logan treed Ruger down below us, and I was treated over there. We went to Bones. I had a coon, went back to Ruger. He has a coon. Well, to seal this deal up, it's going to come down to whoever gets struck to go towards their dogs because now Ruger and Bones are going opposite directions because they were cut in opposite directions. They weren't even cut within six-tenths of each other. So, I mean, when we cut them, they were going straight the opposite ways, right where we pointed them. We're at the bottom of this hill, and everybody says coon hunters – in competition hunts are not worth a hoot. Yeah. Well, most people say. Anyway. They're wanting to cheat. Yeah, they're cheaters and everything else. Well, Logan Ray, this is how straight up it was. I just asked Logan, I said, you mind if we walk to the top of this hill, give me an opportunity to hear my dog. And because it all come down to whoever was striking their dog first, because that's where, which way we were moving. And you're moving away from the yeah. other one. So Logan Ray's like, yeah, let's go to the top of the hill. Well, it's raining and windy. We didn't think we were going to hear either one of them. I got lucky a train come through, and I told them boys why that train was coming through. I said, I can hear bones. And they all thought I was full of shit. <laughs> and old Eddie, Eddie Simmons, he's sitting there just shaking his head. And the bad thing is I heard Ruger twice behind us, but neither one of us were wanting to really strike because of the wind and rain. Yeah. So, and then the train come through, and then you hear Bones treed, and I tr- struck him, and then, you know, the rest was history. We had to walk to him, you know, after that. After How far was he? 1.79. That's what Eddie, Eddie still talks about that. We walked, we crossed two roads going to him, and we, Mr. Eddie was, we were wore out by yeah. the time we got to him. Eddie is one of the greatest men to be in a cast with on the yes. planet, and he's still, and how many, uh, Eddie's been in, Either handling, judging, play by play, and something yep. hundreds and th- maybe thousands of casts. Yes. And every cast he's in, he's just like a little kid. He still loves it, yep. which is fantastic. And Eddie still talks about that cast. Yeah. Uh, tell me about the tree when you got to Bones' tree. It was a hedge tree, and I was fixing to beat him because I thought <laughs> he just lost me super stakes. And so I'm sitting there and I'm looking around, looking around, and Logan's goes, Yeah. Man, he gave you a shot, you know, yada, yada, yada. And Hensley's like, oh, you got to show me something. I'm like, well, I ain't finding much, you know. I mean, it's April. Yeah. Hedge trees didn't have a lot of leaves on them. You ain't getting circled. I looked over, and there's a branch broke out that went into this oak tree, and it was laying right in the crotch. And I was like, oh, my God. Am I really seeing this? And I looked over at Hensley, and I said, hey, Mike, come here. He comes over and I said, do you agree with them touch? And Logan looks at him and goes, are you an idiot? <laughs> and I'm like, what? And I said, just want to make sure they touch. And sitting right on that, tr- that limb that was laid in the 
crotch of that oak, the coon was sitting there. Yeah. And then I was a little kid, you know, because <laughs> I mean, I, I've been to super stakes. I don't know how many times, you know, and finally won it, you know, been right there to be in the finals and everything else, but mm-hmm. just never worked out. Well, yeah. I say you got close several times. In yeah. Super stakes. Yeah. All right. Finley. Uh, I think, uh, we cleared the air on a few things. Competition hunters are not cheaters. No, I don't know. How many, how many casts you've been cheated in? I mean, flat out, straight up, cheated in. Probably three in my entire life, and I deserved it. All three of them. <laughs> I ain't gonna lie. <laughs> how many casts have you been in, do you think, rough estimate? Oh, I don't even know. I, I bet I've been in over a thousand. Yeah, I'd say I'm probably 150 casts in myself. I know I don't go to a lot of hunts, but I'm in, I've been in several casts, and I can think of one that I straight up got really, well, two, straight up really got cheated in. But, I mean, usually when you get cheated, you deserve it. Yeah. It's something you did in the past that comes back to haunt you. And <laughs> you think that was the case with your three? I know it you was. probably had it coming. Yeah. <laughs> and the thing is, you just take it and you grin and you yeah. go on. Know how to lose. We talked about yeah. that. You got to hey, know how to lose. The thing is, when you get on a winning streak, you're on a winning streak. Mm-hmm. When you're on a losing streak, you're on a losing streak. What, what, one more thing before we, before we wrap this up. If someone's got a good dog, uh, they think they got a good dog, they're a young kid or even an older fella, and they decide, you know, I want to give this competition coon hunting a try. What's your, I want just one key tip for that person. What, what, what's he really got to do before he ever packs that dog to a clubhouse? Go hunting with unfamiliar dogs. Okay. Take That's your important. dog. And go hunt it with unfamiliar dogs just to see how it operates. Before before you ever go to a hunt and spend your money, that's what I would do. Okay. All right, folks. That is Jed Finley, Mr. Trader Inc. himself and my friend. And uh, this is The Truth with the Houndsman XP. And we thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you.